Jesus plus nothing. 100% natural, no additives. Andrew Farley is celebrating your freedom in Christ. Call in and ask your questions at 877-956-9566. That's toll free at 877-956-9566. Via satellite from Texas, it's The Grace Message with Dr. Andrew Farley. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Grace Message. I'm Andrew Farley. So glad you are joining us live this Sunday afternoon. We are taking your calls, 877-956-9566. We've got open lines, room for you right now to get in with your question. Maybe you've got a question about a scripture passage. Maybe you heard something in church today. And, uh, well, you're not sure about it. You want to talk it over? Let's make it a conversation together right now, 877-956-9566. Now, if you're a first-time caller today, you got to know we love that. And if you're a veteran listener, maybe you've called in the past, you got something fresh on your mind today, join us right now. Open lines, room for you, 877 877- Nine five six nine five six six. All right. Well, we're going to start out today. We got lines full at this very moment. We're going to jump out to Michigan, and we'll talk with Ted. Hey, Ted, what do you got for us today? Yeah, hey. just on communion. Yeah. What, Hello. Yeah. Go yeah, on communion. Just, um, just wondering why why different churches practice communion differently, or allow communion differently. Um, you know, being a member or baptized or you have to be saved. Right. Okay, let's talk about that. Great question. First of all, being a member, what does that even mean? Well, from a biblical perspective, it doesn't mean much unless we're talking about being a member of the body of Jesus Christ. And that's true for every believer So, first of all, church membership is out the door on this one. If we're going to talk about church membership, let's call it what it is. Uh, It is an organizational decision that some denomination or some church organization decides to make, hey, we want to have a membership. And so they write that into their church constitution, they write that into their organizational documents, and they decide to have a church membership. But 2,000 years ago, that did not exist. There were no 501c3 nonprofit organizations. There were no churches that were registered with the government. So this idea of church membership is an invention. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it, but I just want to point that out. Now, let's relate that to communion, because that's the core of your question. The bottom line is anybody should be able to celebrate the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I don't see anywhere in Scripture that uh, you're supposed to get out your clipboard and decide who is worthy enough to take communion based on their recent track record, based on their church membership, based on their performance lately. No, that is not what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where the Lord's Supper is discussed. So as far as who can take it, I'm going to say God's really excited when anybody is looking to Jesus. I mean, God is really excited when anybody wants to celebrate the body and blood of Christ. So you got me. I mean, you're asking why do all these churches, why do they have certain hoops to jump through and certain requirements to participate in the Lord's Supper And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, they're making it up uh, because at the end of the day, why do some churches not let children participate? I don't know. I mean, don't you think children, it would be okay if they focused on Jesus and celebrated the finished work of Christ? What about visitors to a church? Do we really want to say, no, 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 not you? Now, you cannot participate. We're not going to let you focus 
on Jesus today. So you have to let the cup pass, as they say. you got to let the Welch's and the Wonder Bread pass by while everybody else gets to celebrate Jesus except you. Why? Because you're a visitor. Oh, well, I'm not sure I'm a visitor for long then. (laughs) I mean, what in the world are we doing turning people off to celebrating the Lord's Supper? So there was no such thing as church membership, Ted. That is a modern-day invention. Secondly, there is no chapter and verse that tells us to turn away children from the Lord's Supper. Thirdly, there is no chapter and verse that tells us to turn away visitors or, quote, non-members. Now, where did some of this come from? Because, obviously, it's not created in a vacuum. It's got a background to it. It came from somewhere. So where? Well, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you do see a passage where Paul says a man must examine himself. All right, so we take those two words, examine himself, and we just rip them out of context, and we decide we're going to invent a way for people to examine themselves And so what comes next? Well, you know, as well as I do, if you've spent five weeks in a church, uh, well, you've probably experienced this to some degree somewhere, and that is that uh, they're going to dim the lights on you, and they're going to play the saddest music they can find. Oh, my goodness. And then there's that woman. She's bawling her eyes out on aisle seven. She is trying to get clean and get close to God again before the Welches and the Wonder Bread reach her row. Now, is that what God wanted? Is that what Paul is describing? Is that what he is prescribing for the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? No way. No way. We got people today who are trying to qualify for a supper that celebrates that Jesus qualified them. Did you hear that? I mean, you talk about irony. Oh, my. We are trying to qualify for a supper that is designed to celebrate that Jesus qualified us. Talk about irony. The enemy loves this. One of the greatest celebrations on the planet. I mean, you got water baptism. That's pretty awesome. That's a great celebration. You've got the Lord's Supper. That's pretty awesome. That's a celebration. And yet, here we are, dimming the lights, playing the sad music, inspecting our recent track record, trying to get clean and get close five minutes before we chug the Welch's grape juice. Now, is that what God had in mind when he said a man must examine himself? Of course not. Of course not. What he's really talking about here is the Corinthians were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. He says, what? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Do you despise the church of God? Do you shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this I will not praise you. All right, so what's going on? Well, I just gave you the true context, the true context of a man examining himself. They were getting drunk. They were not eating at home first. And so that's why Paul literally says in verse 20, Therefore, when you meet together in your eating, some of you take your own supper first, And one of you is hungry, and the other is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat dinner in? That's what he's asking them. So, get this. This is not supposed to be 500 people dimming the lights, bawling their eyes out. This is supposed to be a common sense look at, are you abusing the Lord's Supper? Are you getting drunk? Are you eating up all the food? Are you waiting for the poor people who are showing up next? 
Or did you get there early and scarf it all down? Because if you did, then you need to examine what you're doing and you need to eat it and drink it in a worthy manner. Now, if you're listening to what I'm saying and you're following it, you have just discovered in Scripture that for 2,000 years, we have been twisting this. It has morphed into a supper of inspection and examination. We, it has morphed and twisted into something that becomes about us and trying to get right and get clean. And really, what does Jesus say? Verse 25, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. And yet the enemy, the accuser, uh, he's great at making us, uh, well, shift our focus away from the Son of God. Then it's no longer about our Savior. It's about our sins. Look at me and how I've done lately. Let me get this cleansing ritual going. Because here come the elements, they're coming down the aisle, they've got the two trays, the bread and the wine, here it comes, I better get right in three minutes or less. So we've made it about us. But in context, what does Paul say? He says there's divisions among you, there's factions among you, verse 18, verse 19, There must be factions among you. I hear that there are divisions among you. He says, therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Because one of you is taking his dinner first. One of you ends up drunk as a skunk. One of you is scarfing down all the bread. What? Don't you have houses to eat in? And so he says, examine your practices. That's what he's talking about. And that's why he ends this chapter by saying this. This is Paul's conclusion. This is God's solution to the whole thing. Here it comes. Verse 33. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait Wait for one another. If anybody is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. All right, do you hear the issue? I mean, the issue is they're coming together. They're judging each other. There's factions and divisions. They're critical of each other. And and who wouldn't be? I mean, come on. If I showed up to your Lord's Supper, but I showed up 20 minutes early, I grabbed the two trays, all the bread, all the wine, and I went out behind the church building and just chugged it. I mean, just chugged everything down. You would say, wait a minute, Farley. You know what? This is not appropriate. You need to examine what you're doing, and you need to eat and drink in a worthy manner that is respectful of the body and blood of Christ. And then if I I have my wits about me, I'm going to say, yes, you're right. I'm wrong. I have examined what I've done, and it was drunkenness and gluttony, and it was wrong. And there you have it. Case closed. But, but, this is not about 2,000 years of inspection that the church is supposed to be doing every week, every month, every time there's the Lord's Supper. We're not supposed to be sitting there in the dark, bawling our eyes out, wondering if we're pure enough to drink of the cup. That was never Paul's meaning. You're drinking from the cup because you are forever forgiven. You are eating the bread because Jesus is the bread of life. You are eating and drinking because it is finished. You are eating and drinking with confidence because he has qualified you. So, how about you turn that frown upside down? How about you smile and toast? How about you celebrate with heaven, celebrate the finished work of Jesus Christ. What if you're clean and close and qualified? And what if this is not about you trying to get right at the last minute? What if you can eat and drink with joy in your heart? Well, you can. 
you can because Jesus Christ has qualified you. So let's stop it. I mean, Ted's asking, he's asking, why is the Lord's Supper so different in every place? One place, the kids get to do it. The other place, the kids are turned away. One place, the visitors get to do it. The other place, they're turning away visitors. One place, they apparently know who's saved and who's not, so they're saying Christians can do it, but don't let any seekers do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like we really want to be turning people away. Please do not focus. Do not look over here. Do not focus on the body and blood of Christ. Please do not participate. Is that really the message that we want to give people? I'm sorry, but I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing it in the passage. I'm not seeing it in the New Testament. I would say to any human, look, bring it on. If you want to come meet with us and contemplate what did Jesus' blood do and what did Jesus' resurrection accomplish, come on, be a part of it. And, you know, I have to reflect on why we have been so restrictive with people. Why are we turning away the kids? Why are we turning away the visitors? And here's what I think. I think that we're doing it because we think that something new is happening for us at the Lord's Supper. And, oh, the unbeliever better not participate because they're not allowed to have this effect. Oh, but the kids, they might not all know Jesus yet, so they're not allowed to have this new thing that's happening in the moment we take the Lord's Supper. Well, I'm here to say nothing new is happening. You are not getting pure by Welch's grape juice. You are not getting clean through Wonder Bread. You are not getting right through food and drink. We are eating and drinking in remembrance of the Lord and what he's already done. So if we realize nothing new is happening, if we realize it's a public celebration, if we realize it's just reflecting on what Jesus already accomplished, then suddenly it makes sense to let anybody enjoy it. Let anybody celebrate what Jesus did. It is finished, and nothing new is happening. And you know what, quite candidly, I mean, speaking of something new happening, I've seen people celebrate the Lord's Supper and then understand the gospel for the first time. Don't we want that? I mean, our pastors, teachers, leaders, doing the Lord's Supper is a wonderful opportunity to share the gospel. Don't we want people paying attention and participating then? Why would we get out our clipboard and check their membership and check their age and check their recent performance to decide if they can celebrate Jesus? Give me a break. If we got out that clipboard, everybody in the church would have to exit out the back. Nobody would qualify based on their recent track record. But the gospel is that Jesus qualified us. Ted, thanks for your question there in Michigan. Reach out to us again anytime. You're listening to Andrew Farley and The Grace Message. You can find out more about us at our website at andrewfarley.org. I'm so excited to be with you this Sunday afternoon. If you're enjoying our weekend edition, you got to know we're on six days a week. That's right, every weeknight at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. It's rush hour in California, 5 p.m. Every single weeknight, you can catch the Grace Message. We love what we do. It is so fun to get your questions. You never know what you're going to get. And speaking of that, let's uh, jump out now to Maryland, and we'll talk with Viola. Hey, Viola. Oh, how you doing, Brother Andrew? Hey. What Hello. Got, yeah, what do you got for uh, us? You know what? Uh, I want you to expound on the uh, verse about uh, not being of the world. I, I try to look it up myself and try to 
you know, even though I read your books, is good. Mm-hmm. But every time I, I talk to you in person and you answer them, so you always got extra nuggets of truth, <laughs> you know, oh, to, to yeah. bring you on, the, on these verses. So yeah. the, my first question is, what does it really mean to be uh, not of the world? Uh, okay. I know okay. I went to John, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, James, and it says, don't be of the world. But then the second question is, I heard, I was reading my daily bread this morning, and it says, uh, the last enemy that was defeated was death. And then I was saying, hmm, death, that's not a person. I mean, an enemy, death is not, it couldn't be a person. I was saying, what other spiritual enemies have been defeated before mm. death? Mm. Okay. All right. Good. Well, first of all, you got two great questions there. I mean, are, are we not of the world? Do we need to try to not be of the world? Uh, what's what's up with that? And then, secondly, uh, who's our enemy? I mean, who are these defeated enemies? Uh, so, you got two great questions for us to contemplate. I really appreciate you bringing them to the broadcast today, Vi- Viola. Uh, yeah, as far as who we are. I mean, remember, we don't have to wake up and try to be aliens. I mean, we're told in the New Testament that we are aliens in this world. We don't have to try to be ambassadors. We're told in the New Testament we are ambassadors for Christ. We don't have to try to be different. The gospel is that you got your heart ripped out. You got your heart ripped out and replaced. And you got a new nature, you got a new self. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, you were, your old self was crucified with him. And Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. So we don't have to try to make this true. It just is true. And so that's our nature. I think you gotta you got to realize what's already been done in order to act differently. So we can talk about acting differently, and uh, quite candidly, you know, that's what that's what you hear in church a lot these days. You got to act differently. You got to be different. Well, we don't disagree with that. Uh, that you're gonna act differently if you know you're different. So these are two different philosophies. Uh, you know, the bottom line is you're gonna act like who you think you are. So if you think you're dirty and distant then you're going to act dirty and distant. If you think you're clean and close to God, then you're going to act clean and close to God. You're always, over time, you're always going to act like who you think you are. So identity in Christ is not a small issue because it is the driver. It is the driver of everything we do. You are always going to act in a manner that is consistent with who you are over time. Yeah, there will be exceptions, but over five years and 50 years, you are going to act like who you believe yourself to be. So that's why we, we learn our identity. That's why we learn who we are in Christ, because when I realize, I'm going to use an expression here that just blows me away every time I say it. If we realize we are slaves of righteousness, that means that we are harnessed to righteousness. We are addicted to Jesus. We live and breathe righteousness. We can't get away from it. We're slaves to it. We're connected to it. We're bonded to it. You can't get away from righteousness. So if you believe that, then it is going to affect your choices. I mean, it just is. Now, if you believe the opposite, let's say that you believe what you were told maybe in the Bible Belt in some church somewhere five years ago, ten years ago, you were told that you are a sinner. You are a dirty, rotten sinner, but saved by God's grace. Well, if that's what you think you are, then you're going to act like it. So as far as being not of this world, it starts with realizing you're already an alien. You're already not of this world. You're already a slave of righteousness. So when you try to sin, 
your heart is going to hate it. Now, I know what you've heard. I mean, legalism says you're dirty, but please act clean. Legalism says you're distant, but please try to get close. Legalism says you're no good. You're bad, but please try to act good. That's not the gospel. Let me say that again. It is not the gospel. The gospel is you're a child of light. Therefore, walk as a child of light. Be who you are. Count yourself alive to God. You got this vine branches connection? Are you kidding me? This is better than any Bible Belt legalism you could concoct. I mean, Bible Belt legalism says if you read your Bible every day and you pray every day and you go to church every week and you go to Bible study and you do your quiet time and you witness to enough people, you will get closer to God. And the gospel says, nope, not going to happen. You can't get closer to God when you're one spirit with the Lord. You can't get closer to God when you've been raised and seated with Christ in heavenly places. You can't get close to God when you're united with Christ. There is no getting closer because you're close. And how did you get close? It was through the blood and the resurrection. Not Bible study, but blood. Not all of your reading, but resurrection. Now, do I love the Word of God? Absolutely. Have we been reading the Word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 today? Yes, we read many verses, didn't we? I love the Word of God. I love Bible study. I love the Bible. Man, we don't have a message without the message that is portrayed throughout this beautiful book. But it's about the author, and it's about what the author has done. And all I'm saying is, it's finished. You're clean, you're close, you're new, you're righteous, you're holy, you're blameless. we got to stop telling people to try to get what they've already got. we got to stop telling people to try to get clean and get close and inch closer to the God of the universe through what they do when, in fact, it's through what Jesus has done. So, with that said, start with the premise that you are not of this world. You are an alien. You are an ambassador. You are a child of light. You are the righteousness of God. And when we believe that, well, we're going to act like it. Now, you ask about the enemy. You said, well, who are these defeated enemies? And yes, Jesus conquered death, meaning that through the resurrection, we have the beautiful truth that we're never going to die. I mean, yes, we fall asleep, but we're never really going to die because we awaken to the sound of the trumpet. We awaken to see him face to face. So clearly, Jesus has defeated the enemy that is known as death. And so now we got to ask, all right, uh, what else? What else has Jesus defeated? Well, he's defeated the power of sin. We are dead to sin and alive to God now. And he's conquered, you might say, conquered sin and death. So uh, what else? Well, you, you look at uh, the enemy himself. It says the enemy is his footstool. That means Ottoman, you know, that thing that we prop our feet up on. Well, Colossians 2 right around verse 15, talks about how the enemy is defeated. I like to say he's all bark and no bite. Uh, the enemy, when you're talking to him, why are you talking to him? And when you're listening to him, why are you listening to him? Uh, because he's like a whiny trial lawyer when the case has already been lost. I mean, he's lost the case. It's over. He's sitting on the courthouse steps whining at you, accusing you, trying to prosecute everything all over again. And it says in Colossians 2.15 that Jesus has disarmed the powers and authorities, 
triumphing over them by the cross. So, you have no accuser. The accuser who accuses you day and night has no real ammunition. He's all bark and no bite. Thanks for your call, Viola. Reach out to us again. Always love hearing from you. All right, well, let's go now to Virginia, and we'll talk with Nadine. Hey, Nadine, what do you got? Uh, uh, hi. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine who is Catholic. Um, we were debating... Um, uh, 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 we were debating um, um, communion, and I was saying that communion is symbolic. Yeah. And she's saying, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is. And <laughs> uh, she said, no, it's not. It, it, it really is the body and the blood of Christ. And mm-hmm. I said, you know, it, it's not. I mean, he, 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 he's not hanging on the cross anymore. He is resurrected. Mm-hmm. His body is in heaven. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, uh, he, he's alive. He's not. I mean, and uh, the, uh, the other, uh, the, uh, uh, the acolyte um, mm-hmm. um, said that um, mm-hmm. he, uh, he, each time we have communion, you know, he's on the cross. Yeah, and yeah. And I said, no, no, he's not. I mean, he's he's right. not on the cross. He 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 right. he, uh, he he is risen. Amen. So, Amen. All right. Well, let's talk about this. I mean, this is the the classic debate that has been out there for a thousand years plus. I mean, uh, you got uh, the early church who's trying to say Jesus is risen. He's never going to die again. That's what the epistles say. That's what the letters of Paul, Peter, James, and John, the book of Hebrews say. They say he died once for all. They say he's never going to die again. They say it is finished. And yet uh, you had people disagreeing with that 2,000 years ago. Then you had, you fast forward, you know, hundreds and thousands, a thousand years, you got to uh, what do you got? The Protestant Reformation. You got uh, John Calvin. You got uh, Martin Luther. You got lots of folks who are trying to talk about the truth in one regard or another. And then you've got the Catholic Church that is uh, digging their heels in and trying to say, no, no, Jesus is still dying. And every time you put bread in your mouth, you are participating in his ongoing death. Well, that is not biblical. That is not the truth. I don't care if a thousand or a million or a billion Catholics say it. I don't care if the Pope says it or every Pope who's ever lived says it. It's not the truth. And I don't care who says it. Because what matters is what Jesus said. What matters is the actual gospel. Now, what did Jesus say? You go to Luke 22. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Remembrance. He doesn't say, do this to activate something. So we have to recognize the words of Jesus Christ himself. This is not optional theology. Uh, Paul carries this same theme in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim. Okay, that's what you're doing. You're proclaiming something in memory of something. So the evidence is in, and the Catholics have got it wrong. That is the bottom line, plain and simple. The words of Jesus say, do this in remembrance of me. He makes no mention of of something new happening. The key word is remembrance. Then in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is saying the same thing. At this Lord's Supper, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim it. What does it mean to proclaim? It means to share it. It means to announce it. It it means to declare it. You're talking about something that has already happened. All right. So then we go on. Let's talk about 
what brings life. How about John chapter 6? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Jesus is making it clear that His Spirit and His Word gives life to us. It is not the physical consumption of bread and wine. How about Hebrews chapter 10? It says, But when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are the holy ones. Now, do you hear that? I mean, this passage, Hebrews 10, is highlighting that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was a one-time event that made believers perfect forever. It does not su- it does not suggest, it does not say that his body and his blood need to be continually offered. It says the opposite. In fact, the book of Hebrews says he is not dying daily. What does that tell you? He's not up in heaven dying daily because he died once for all. And so that's a really big truth that every Catholic needs to be told. Every Catholic needs to be told that when Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice, he sat down and he does not need daily like those other priests to offer again and again, day after day. In the Old Testament, they continually offered more and more sacrifices. Remember, Israel Israel would go and day after day, every priest would stand and perform his religious duties again and again. He would offer the same sacrifices over and over, but Jesus did something different. He did the once for all. He did the one and only. So he is not going to die ever again. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to be candid with you. I'm going to tell you why the Catholics are doing this. At least they're being consistent in their error, because here's what they're doing. They're at least saying that forgiveness only comes by blood. Okay, that part is correct. Forgiveness only comes by blood. Now, if you're going to believe that you get forgiveness little by little, like paying off your car, like paying for your house, paying your mortgage, if you're going to believe that you're forgiven little by little, day by day, in installments, then you better be teaching that Jesus is shedding his blood little by little. If the forgiveness is little by little, then the bloodshed better be little by little. Because then at least you're consistent in your error. Do you hear that? So they are teaching little by little bloodshed and little by little forgiveness. They are teaching weekly bloodshed and weekly forgiveness. They are teaching monthly bloodshed and monthly forgiveness. They are teaching that Jesus is still dying, and they are teaching that you are still being forgiven progressively. So at least they're consistent. But where they're wrong is this. Jesus died once, and you were forgiven once. Jesus shed his blood once, and you were cleansed once. Jesus will never die again, and you will never be more forgiven than you are right now. So that is fully consistent with the facts. It's true that only through bloodshed does forgiveness come. That's true. But what they're missing is that Jesus will never shed his blood again. 
and therefore you will never ever be forgiven any more than you already have been. You are a totally forgiven person, past, present, and future. Hebrews 10.14 says it. I don't even have to explain it. It just says it. It's in our face. It's like a neon sign. It is like God is shouting this from the rooftops. No explanation needed. It simply says, by one sacrifice, you've been made perfect forever. Catholics say you're made perfect progressively. God says you're made perfect forever. Catholics say that Jesus' sacrifice is little by little, daily, monthly, progressively, yearly, mass after mass, little by little. God says Jesus died once for all. Who's right? When you and the God of the universe disagree, who's right? So I hope that helps, Nadine. You got something to talk about with your friend. Maybe share this with them. Who knows? Who knows? You can pray for them. You can share the truth with them. But at the end of the day, they got to decide, is Jesus ever going to die again? Did it work the first time? Is it really about me and my memory? Do I really need to get out a mobile app or use a supercomputer in Washington to keep up with my confessions? What if I miss one? What if I leave one out? What if I forget one? Well, wait a minute. You already have. You've, you've sinned thousands, millions of times in your life. You can't remember them all. To confess them all, you've already forgotten so many. Thank God it is not about your memory. It is about the blood of Jesus Christ, and it is finished. Thanks again, Nadine. Call us back anytime. You're listening to The Grace Message. I'm Andrew Farley. I'm so excited to be with you today. I tell you what, if you like what you're hearing today, you want to dive a little deeper with us, go to our website at andrewfarley.org. Also, did you know we give out emails of encouragement three times a week? You can sign up for these emails. And if you want just a, I don't know, a five-minute reminder of your identity if you want a reminder of your forgiveness, if you want a reminder of the love of God in your life, well, this is going to give you a shot in the arm. Several times a week, you can get encouragement from the Grace Message simply by signing up for our emails. If you haven't done that yet, this is unique content that I write and share with you several times a week to encourage you. Again, go to our website to find out more about that at andrewfarley.org. And while you're there, you can click on the, the uh, media tab and uh, dive a little deeper. Listen to a message. We've got Sunday morning messages. We've got radio programs and podcasts. We've got all kinds of stuff to encourage you in the love and grace of God. So go to our website at andrewfarley.org. All right, we're going to go to Michigan now, and we'll talk with Alex. Hey, Alex, what do you got? Hi, Andrew. Hey, thanks for being there and running such a good program and being so helpful to other people. Um, I got a quick question for you, and uh, I don't want to go in the wrong direction, but in the Bible it talks about when Cain killed Abel, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, from what I read in the past, I believe where there's a part where uh, Abel, uh, God said, Abel's blood cries out to me, okay? Um, and again, forgive me if I got that wrong, but I, I could have swore I read that. Yeah. So my reference is today with you, the question is uh, people that have been murdered or killed because of somebody else, you know, just being all wrong, um, and they they never really got a chance to accept Jesus as their Savior. Uh, do you think that God, or is there any reference in the Bible, that where God would uh, hold that a little different? You know, uh, I, I know that ultimately, if you don't accept Jesus and you die, then that's it's, it's over for you, right? But 
I guess that's where I'm at with this particular situation. You know, I mean, I haven't had anybody in my family recently murdered, but yeah. um, I'd like you to reference that for me if you could. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, the passage that you're talking about, Alex, is uh, Genesis chapter 4. It says, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And, of course, you know what happens. I mean, they're out in the field, and Cain attacks him and, and kills him. And then the Lord shows up on the scene and says to Cain, Where is your brother? And, uh, well, Cain lies. He basically says, uh, I don't know. (laughs) And uh, he goes on. He gets a little chip on his shoulder. He gets defensive. He says, am I my brother's keeper? And then the Lord exposes what he already knows. He says, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So, that's your that's your quote. It's straight out of Genesis uh, four, and uh, you know what God is saying there is, hey, you're not fooling me. Uh, and uh, then you've got uh, you got the simple idea that you can't trick God. I mean, you can't hide around the corner and say boo and expect to uh, surprise him. Uh, because that's not going to happen. Uh, God knows everything. So that's the that's the meaning of this quote. And uh, then you've got this idea in the uh, in the New Testament. One of my favorite books of the Bible, Hebrews twelve. It says Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. It says, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now that's interesting. Hebrews twelve twenty four. The author of Hebrews uses the story in Genesis to highlight the new covenant, and he says the sprinkled blood of Jesus is better than the blood of Abel. All right. So what does that mean? Well, every Jewish person knows the story of how Cain killed Abel, and about that blood testifying from the ground. But the author of Hebrews is saying that the blood of Jesus testifies to something greater. So I don't think we want to read into this anything beyond that, Alex. I think we've uh, exhausted it for what it is. Uh, God is simply telling Cain, I know what you've been up to. You can't fool me. You can't trick me. And then in the New Testament, it is referenced because uh, Jesus' blood also testifies, just like Abel's blood testified, but to a greater degree. I mean, Jesus' blood testifies that you're forgiven forever. Jesus' blood testifies that you're clean and close to God forever. The blood of Jesus testifies that you have perfect peace with God. There's no barrier wall. There's no divide. There's no gap. We keep hearing things in religious circles today about how God might not hear your prayers if you've sinned too much. Hogwash, nonsense. The Bible doesn't say that. Uh, he is, his ear is toward the righteous. His face is always toward us, uh, even when we mess up and maybe even most importantly when we fail. We can approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence. The blood of Jesus testifies. So as far as your question about after death, I mean, there's no second chance of passage. You're not going to see anything like that. The book of Hebrews says that it is destined for man to die once and then face judgment. It doesn't say you die then you get a second chance or two, and then you face... No, it says you die and you face judgment. So here's the thing. I think we got to be in a position of gratefulness by just saying, look, God, I know that in the Old Testament, millions, I mean millions of my ancestors died with no hope. My ancestors were pagans, My ancestors were barbarians. My ancestors were Gentiles. Hello? That means they were not part of Israel. They did not know Yahweh. They did not have the Old Testament. They were not familiar with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were pagans. 
dancing around a campfire, asking pagan deities for a good crop. I mean, come on. Our ancestors, Ephesians says, they had no hope, they were excluded, and they had no God. So, here comes Jesus, the game changer. Here comes Jesus, the renegade. He's going to offer salvation, not just to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. Not just to Israel, but also to those dirty, rotten pagans like my great, 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 great grandpa. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that there's even a chance. Thank you that there's even a way. Because it used to be that there really wasn't a way. I mean, sure, maybe a random Gentile like Rahab, the prostitute, sure, she could put her faith in God. Next thing you know, she's justified. But for the most part, Ephesians says, those Gentiles, my ancestors and yours, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. They had no covenant, no hope, and no God. So, does it really matter the manner in which we pass away? Does God say, oh, that guy was killed, therefore, uh, you know, I'm going to give him a second chance later? No, no, no. We cannot build a theology around that rationale. We cannot build a belief system around that. Now, at the end of the day, can we say God's heart is big? And, I mean, look at David. Come on. He had a child that died. In infancy, he had a child that died, and he says, "Uh, this child is not coming back. He says, this child is not going to return to me, but I will go to him. I will go to be with him where he is. And, you know, when David said that in 2 Samuel 12, it's right there in verse 23, he says, can I bring him back again? No. I will go to him. So David says, I'm going to be reunited with my infant son that died. How do you explain that? What theology box do you put that one in? Well, you just have to really fall back on the big heart of God. God God has this market cornered on justice and love. So we're not going to put him in a box successfully. But we certainly don't want to be running around town teaching a theology of second chance after death. It is not in Scripture and second chance based on manner of death. No, it is not in Scripture. So I hope that helps clear it up, my friend. It is a good question. It's an important one, especially for those who have lost children especially for those who wonder about uh, people who are impaired and unable in some way to understand the gospel. God's heart is big. His, His heart is bigger than ours. His mercy and love and forgiveness and grace are bigger than we could possibly imagine or dream up. So we can always fall back on the gracious heart of God, and we should. So again, Alex, thanks for bringing this up. Reach out to us again anytime. Great question. Well, again, you've been listening to The Grace Message. I'm Andrew Farley. If you like what you heard, you want to support The Grace Message, go to our website at andrewfarley.org and give your gift today. Oh, my goodness, we are so grateful for your support. We cannot do it without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for loving us in this way and helping us reach even more people. For more information on the broadcast ministry of Dr. Andrew Farley, please visit andrewfarley.org. That's andrewfarley.org. Join us next time as we invite you to celebrate the grace message with Dr. Andrew Farley. This program is sponsored by Your 